You're listening to the Veteran Etc. Podcast, as there's always more to be said about a veteran. Join your host, Mike Kim, a veteran, ex-monk, season war trauma therapist, and writer, as he shares his years of research in veteran readjustment culture and the meaning of warrior life. Now, here's your host, Mike Kim. Welcome to Veteran Etc. This is a show based on the culture of veterans, the culture of veteran readjustment, the lives of veterans, and those tied to veterans, veteran allies, and also not so much the veteran-civilian divide, but the veteran-civilian understandings and misunderstandings. Here on this show, we break the, my the myths and the tropes of what veterans are all about, and we examine different life worlds. And one life world that has truly touched me is the life world of a man by the name of Bill McDonald, Reverend, Reverend Bill McDonald, someone who has influenced me on so many different levels. And I can say not just me, but many others. But ironically enough, I got to know him through his poetry. That's how I met him. I met him reading his poetry, and that's what led me to get in contact with him and to know more about his life. And here today, we will be engaging his life, and we will be getting to know different views that he might have regarding just spirituality, but the world and the different issues veterans may have. And so, Bill, can you share a little bit about yourself so our viewers can know more? Well, thanks for having me again in a conversation with you. We, I always enjoy the, uh, the you know, going back and forth with you. And you certainly are not afraid to step out there and, and, and speak your mind. Nobody will ever accuse you of being shy or, or lacking an opinion. But uh, that's what makes you who you are. And as you talked about, veterans are, are a diversity of people and cultures. Th there's this umbrella of being a veteran, experienced experience that we've all gone through. We, especially combat vets, let's get real. I mean, you've been in the military, that's a brotherhood. That's good. I mean, you, you, you volunteer, you wear the uniform, whether you see combat or not, I still salute you. You were available and uh, you were willing to do what you had to do. But those that go into combat together have a, a certain family, a certain tribe. Those that go into combat in a different zone, a different year, different decade, different war, they relate to the other ones, even if it's not the same war. You know, Korean War vets can relate to Vietnam vets, and Iraqi vets can relate to Gulf War vets and Vietnam vets, and it's family. And, and stepping from that place, I look at the veteran community as a tribe. And I've been working with a psychologist uh, up in Spokane, Seattle, or someplace in Washington. I'm not exactly sure where he's at. But this doctor, he put together a book with a Native American medicine man in, in Colorado. We, we can talk about that at another time. He's a guest you probably should have on your show. And they went back to using modern psychology and modern thinking on treating PTSD and combined it with thousand year, 1500 year, 2000 year old Native American tradition. In other words, Native Americans, when they went to battle with another tribe or with whoever, they suffered the same problems that veterans have suffered since the Romans and the Egyptians and the Greeks. They, they all, Napoleon's army, they all suffered the consequences of the after battle. And that's as plenty as I put it. You survived a battle, you get your, you're there for it, you're focused, you got to do what you got to do. It's the afterthoughts. It's the times of non-battle that has been the big deal for veterans. And this is the part that civilians don't get. Fighting the war is easy. Fighting your enemy is easy. But when the war is over, the enemy becomes your own thoughts and your own moves. And becomes that depression, becomes that attack on your psyche, and, and peace is gone. 
So for some veterans, and you know this, for some veterans, they've never ended the battle. It's they're still anticipating an, another another attack. Is there going to be explosion going down? Because I've been dealing with veterans, helping them before the term post traumatic stress ever was invented. I mean, I come back from Vietnam, 1967, got out of the army in 68. By 1970, I was already ministering to veterans. We had to have, I mean, there was cra you know, crazy vets. That's all they said. Yeah, crazy Vietnam vets. I mean, it wasn't even a term, you know, but it's been progressing. And it has become a part of who I am and what I do. And I wake up each day and it's like, there's somebody out there waiting. There's somebody in need. What more can I do? Now, my age, helping individual veterans is difficult because it's just one of me. And there's, I'm getting thousands of emails, seriously, thousands of emails a week. I, I, I can't nurture them all individually. So I, I've been sharing stories I, on video. I, I'm sharing my stories on, on text, you know, and books and, and in blogs. Let me stop you there. Let me stop you there. With the, yeah. with the yes, yes, because the the autobiography that you wrote, yes, has been touching veterans, not just from the Vietnam War, but from my war, from my dad's war, from other wars, as well as international vets. And I'm just wondering, what do you think? is the, the reason. And, and I, I want to know this because, you know, it's important. No man is an island, all right? No man's alone in the battlefield, even if he thinks he is. There's a spiritual, almost esoteric DNA that runs through the blood of veterans, all warriors, even your enemies. You, sometimes I, I, I really believe this. This is crazy, but maybe you'll understand. Sometimes there's more respect for my enemy than there is the civilians that didn't serve. It's like, I understand this guy is trying to kill me. I can understand that. He's doing, he's following his beliefs. It's, it's his flag, his country, whatever. And I'm never too sure about the people who didn't serve on either side. It's a different brotherhood. So I, I've never really hated the enemy. I understand the brotherhood of all veterans. I feel that. I feel that because when I first met you, I was a little bit hesitant to contact you, but I said, if anything, I'm going to contact him because he's a great poet. And folks, are you listening? Just look under Bill McDonald, Vietnam War Poetry. You'll be able to find not, not just the books, but you'll be able to find his poems go way back, you know, from the 60s on. I mean, and they're incredible poems. But when I contacted Reverend Mac, I, I thought, you know, I don't know if he's going to want to talk to me because, I, you know, my last name, Kim. I mean, even the American Legion w won't, won't. you know, they, they tell me to join the Chinatown Post after I got back from Iraq, you know. So <laughs> it's kind of crazy. It's, it's just crazy. But I thought, you know, I wonder what, I wonder what Bill is going to be like. And then I just felt like from day one, you've always seen me as a, another warrior, as another human being. And so I believe what you're saying about this thing, your respect for all of humanity, and you look at things proportionately with distinctions. And do you think that's a big message in the autobiography that you give, that that's why it's attracted a lot of people? I mean, one way? Well, let me give you an example. I went back with the three other veterans. It was four of us. We called ourselves the Peace Patrol. Going back to Vietnam, you know, in 2002, and I was there in 1967 when I left. So what's that? 40, 50, I don't know how many years. My math in my head is not good. But it was a number of years before. Got they, we got they, it. I left Vietnam. It was trashed. The jungles were all dead from Agent Orange. There was bomb craters from sky horizon to horizon. The villages you go through there, and there's sandbags everywhere. I mean, that was my memories. So we went back. And we had a twofold mission. One, we wanted to tour the old places that we fought and we kind of look at memories and see what they look like today. And we wanted to see how things were rebuilt. We also wanted to meet our former enemy. And we went to some dinners and luncheons and things. And then we, I had a side mission where I visited the uh, Sharon Ann Lane Foundation. They built a, a clinic, a medical clinic in Da Nang area. 
and I want to make sure that all the donations were used correctly. And I met with the Communist Party there, and that was interesting because, <laughs> yeah, a lot of money spent. A lot of people had televisions and motorcycles, and there was nobody at the clinic. So another whole story. But anyway, well, an experience that kind of explains part. There was two experiences that were kind of right on the money for your enemy. Once I got shot down in the Iron Triangle. Hmm. And I crashed and I was attacked by, there was an enemy force of estimated, who I don't know who does the estimated, but on a, all the, the after action reports, yeah, yeah. 500 North Vietnamese and, and Viet Cong, right? Some they were knew you were there. Yeah. So some of these guys were uniformed NVA, North Vietnamese Army, regulars, hardcore, right? Yeah. And, and there was, the, you know, the Black Jamma guys, you know, yeah. the VC. And they were taking on a small ranger unit of uh, Arvin's Army of the Republic of Vietnam. So anyway, nine helicopters went in, nine helicopters got shot up. We finally go in, we're the last aircraft. And, uh, and I, we got ground troops, that, the advisors, they have to, the, the uh, military uh, echelon, you know, the, the colonels and stuff want to be on the ground for their troops. So we were in a command and control helicopter. We come into land, the orders are, don't fire your guns, or machine gun, right? Don't fire, there's a mix down there. We don't know the good guys, the bad guys. So there's friendlies on the ground, don't fire back. You get shot at, don't fire back, that's an order. So we're going down and if you're in a helicopter, you know, just before you land, you, you gotta slow down. I mean, you just don't go, yeah. you're floating in, right? And there's like every guy, about 500 rounds of ammo come, everybody's firing it. It looks like, it, a shower of light, you know, white tracers, orange tracers, even some green tracers. I'm not sure what country they were. They, were, they weren't NATO rounds, but there was these tracers coming up. Mm. And I could hear this ping, 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 just like that ping, 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 the tail boom that the, the helicopter, there's oil leaking, there's hydraulic fluid leaking, there's fuel tanks being hit. I mean, this thing's just cheese, right? So we're going in. And one of the guys, I think he was a South Vietnamese major or something, he gets off the aircraft and all his buddies run past him. And he turns around and he's got, a, I think, an AK-47. He's got an 18-round clip in it. And he's aiming right straight at me. I turn around, all I see is this light coming at me. You know, like a, uh, like a laser, you know, from Star Wars or something. Just this light coming. And I feel this crash on my heart. I mean, it knocks the wind out of me and chips from my, I, I just had, my third day I had, I had a chest protector. I had a ceramic vest that I was asked to try out. Before that, I just had a flak vest. Wow. But three days before I just had, a, and you know, flak vest, don't stop nothing, mm -hmm. nothing. Anyway, it's oh. false security. I mean, so I got, I got this heavy plate, right? And me and my, gunner on the other side were trying them out so we had we, we had the only ones in the whole company and it had a back plate and a, a front plate we left the front plates on and we're up against this transmission in the helicopter we don't need no back plate so took the back plate and slid it under our canvas seats because we were getting rounds from the bottom you know that's your spine that's your family heritage i mean all that stuff's down below right so it, it's pretty bad to get one from coming up so there I am, I get hit, I'm out of breath. People tell you, oh, you got a bulletproof rest, you got that. When you get hit, I don't care if it's, if it never got embedded in your skin, you're bruised, you hurt, you got kicked by a mule, right? Boom. So I'm there, and then the cord to my flight helmet broke. Up until that time, I was listening to Armed Forces Radio, and then intermittent calls from the ground. But I was listening to the Stones. You can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> I'm going, I'm all rock and roll, rock and roll war, right? And all of a sudden, boom, there's dead silence. Hmm. And I'm thinking, am I dead? <laughs> hmm. Was that it? Well, that was pretty easy, right? So anyway, so we pull up off the ground. And I can remember that guy looking at me eyeball. It was, we had eyeball to eye contact with that guy. It was like, guy trying to kill you, guy shoots you, 
and you get an eye contact with the guy. Not many people can survive that and say, yeah, I remember we looked at every, each other, right? right? So we went about one football field away, about 100 yards, or as they say in the Army, you know, with 100 meters. It was used meters, which is really crazy because nobody else in the Army, you, gee, I doesn't know what a meter is. Yeah. Well, football field distance, they know, right? I was one of those guys that never adapted to the meters. It was like, okay, we're football field away. We can, we just tried to get away from the battle because it was hand to hand. So we make a unscheduled landing in the jungle. We'll let it go at that. I get off. I realize I'm alive. I'm alive. I mean, I'm not dead, right? So I'm, this is a good thing, right? Always a good thing when you, 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 you know, when you think you're dead, then you're not. So it was a good thing. So I, I go and I, I get the pilot out on my side. Either there's a metal, a big metal plate that you have to slide back on a seat that protects him from the pilots sit there. They got a, they got this thick metal seat, the sides, they got chest, but they, they got all kinds of protective stuff. I mean, the door gunners, that was the first door gunner to get them, but these guys are the pilots have them and, and they, they're protected and they got ballistic helmets and we're sitting back there on canvas seat, no door. Nothing wide open, right? And I thought, well, that's that's interesting. I, you know, it's, you know your value at that time. Yeah. All right. So I get him out. I notice the guard, the, the the gunner's not getting the other guy out. So I go get him out because I'm concerned about fire. This thing could just, you know, helicopters. And then I look over there, and all I see is blood pouring off the floor of the helicopter, dribbling down the side. And I go over there, and my gunner is slooped. You know, he's slooped over his M60 machine gun. Now he's been sitting back to back with me. I'm on one side, yeah. he's 180 degrees the other. We we're both looking out in different directions. And between this is this big metal transmission and a couple of walls. So I couldn't figure it out. But when I, I picked him up, we'll talk about, we'll get back to that. I pick him up, I put him on my shoulders. The guy's about 150 pounds, I'm about 150 pounds. You ever carry anybody on your shoulders and run? 50 60 75 yards with somebody on your shoulders is like uh, so i'm running away from this helicopter right and mm -hmm. i get there at the time i didn't notice it later on i go man that really hurt my back mm -hmm. that's a lot of jarring yeah you know? yeah yeah i mean because i'm going full adrenaline sprint. yeah so we get there and the two pilots are there this gunner's bleeding he's got 17 holes in his back and neck 17 holes and when i picked him up on the back wall of the of the helicopter, where he was sit seating, where he was sitting, there was seventeen exit holes. Okay, keep that in mind. All right, so a gunship comes in, a Huey B model, I think it was, comes in, and it's loaded to. I mean, it's got rockets, it's got everything on it, and it's it's overweight. They take the wounded guy, and they take, of course, they take the major, the pilot. He's a major. He's the aircraft commander. He ain't staying. He goes by, and they go, well, how about us? Well, we got no room. I go, throw something away. You know, we got no room. So they took off and left us. And about eight hours later, yeah, we're on the ground with hand-to-hand -hand combat 100 yards away, and we're left. I'm going, what? <laughs> so I'm, 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 I don't get mad, but I get even. I go, okay. <laughs> I go back to the helicopter, my, my machine gun, and, and I look at the wall behind where I was sitting. Where I'm sitting, there's not one entry hole. I go back the other side, 17 exit holes, directly opposite shadow of where I'm sitting on the other side. So on this side, 18 rounds are fired, one hits me in the heart, 17 disappear and exit the other side, which is impossible because you got a solid metal you know, transmission in there. Huge, right? No bullets going to come through ever. Yeah. So these rounds went boom, somehow like light through me, around me, upside down and back. And kick up. Mm -hmm. yeah. I could, it, it, later on, they investigated it. Nobody could figure Even the, the CIA sent out two people, believe it or not, to take a look at it when they towed it back in. Anyway, I... I I don't want to talk about this part because I'm, I'm trying to make another point. But basically, I, I took the machine gun off. I, I took a, round, a belt of 2,000 rounds of ammo for my M60. We're talking not this little M16 crap, little, you know, 
Right. We're talking seven, seven. points, six two, right? Nato round. And on this belt that I took, because I had that was my assault. I had, I had two thousand rounds for assaults when you go into it, because I wanted to make it look like we had super firepower. Yeah. So normally yeah. your belt comes every fifth round. You got a tracer. Mm-hmm. Well, at our lunchtime and our downtime between flights, me and my gunner would sit there and we'd make new belt and we would take all tracers. 2,000 rounds of tracers and put them all together. A little bit of work, trust me. But So it was solid 2,000 rounds of tracer. You know it's going to burn hot, right? But when it comes out, it's going to look like a torch. It's going to look, you know, it looks solid, right? I mean, it's impressive. And I figured, well, you know what? I don't want to, I want to scare these guys. I want them to think there's more of me, number one. I want the firepower to look bigger. So I took it. I threw the ammo across my shoulder. My the the pilot that stayed. Josh McDonald. Hang on. They uh. Wherever I got a phone. No. I like <laughs> I like the ringtone. All right. I'll let me put call you later. All right. My son, the Gulf War veteran. So I went there and I must have killed two hundred trees. I mean, I'm firing this thing just like I mean I watched John Wayne movies. John Wayne's got the and, 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 and all these heroes, right? They got they got the machine gun on their hip, and they just in the movies nonstop. You were in the military, you know, nonstop, right? Not as I find out later on. Well, if you're a trained infantryman, it's burst of five. You see a tracer come out, you let up, right? Another burst of five, because it's it's not going to cool the barrel down. So I'm going two thousand rounds, right? You know, about two minutes, so all I all I last. You figure 750 rounds a minute, so that's 1,500 rounds I fire. It's white hot, not red, white hot. And all of a sudden, I'm watching this barrel because I, I, I push the trigger, and it doesn't do anything. And I look at the barrel, and it's like, it's got like a 30-degree loop. It's like, doo-doo. I go, it was shaped like a banana. It's like, I go, I didn't know. It's, call me stupid. Call me. I didn't know you could build a, a machine gun barrel and actually make change safe. I had no clue because I heard these infantry guys go, and I was wondering what they were talking about. Yeah, I had to pee on my on the barrel of my gun, you know, to cool it off. I go, what are you talking about? Yeah, because I'm in a helicopter and I got I'm going 100 miles an hour, right? Yeah, yeah you've got yeah, and and I got a, I got I got a big fan blade up there, yeah. you know, the rotors. It's cooling everything down. I got it doesn't ready. matter. Yeah, you don't. I fire all day long. And you don't, you don't need the asbestos gloves and all that. No, nothing, yeah. right? I, I mean, I could pick, you know, after we land, I could touch that the barrel. It's not a problem, right? So I learned a lesson. All of a sudden, I went from and, and everybody running, and all of a sudden, it's quiet. And so, anyway, long story short, me and my, me and my pilot, uh, we, uh, the co-pilot, we ran around the jungle. We call E E and E, escape and evasion. Mm-hmm. which is a fancy word for it. let's let's go hide and run <laughs> but it sounds better yeah we were practicing e and e escape invasion anyway eventually they came eventually before the sun went down they came and got us but wow th- anyway so and i was wounded I, I had a wound in the hand at the time and uh, so i was bleeding and and then there was the concern that wow we get captured by these nvas or, the, or somebody we're gonna we're gonna disappear into the jungles forever Ain't nobody gonna find us, right? Come back where we at. I thought somebody would come back right away, but <laughs> leave no man behind. <laughs> Let's just cover Bill. He leave him behind, right? <laughs> anyway, so anyway, that property where it happened, that place where it happened. I went back. I'm, I, I'm part of the story. Remember, I was going back to Vietnam, Peace mm-hmm. Patrol, right? All right. There was, there's a link to my craziness. So now I'm now I'm back in Vietnam, 2002. That mm-hmm. happened in April of 1967. In fact, I got a distinguished flying cross that day, April 14th. Wow. I think it was April 14th. Yeah, April 14th of 1967. Wow. Wow. And we go to this area where I, I said, well, I, I was shot down right there in that field, right? And there's a farmer's house across from it. Or I thought it was a farmer, you know, some guy was living there. And, and, and the guy that's giving me the tour goes, oh, I was going to stop here. Because we usually visit this old guy here. He was a former, a former Viet Cong, 
and but he was also in the South Vietnamese Army. And he was a veterinarian taking care of their guard dogs and all the animals and stuff. But at night, that's what he did for the South Vietnamese, but at night, he went across the street from his home and he was in the tunnels fixing guys, you know, the, the bad guys. He was under yeah. their hospitals. And I go, wow, what a coincidence, right? And he's, st he's still living there, right? So I go meet this guy. And he's a grandfather, of course. He's an old guy. And he's got his, he's got, he brings his grandkids in to meet me and he brings his children in. And then he sends somebody out to get some Coke. I'm an American, right? Get some Coca Cola. And then he went and he sent somebody to the town and they came back while I was talking to him and they brought ice that they got from the town. You know, and, you know I mean, like, well, you have to have ice and Coke. Hey, you know, okay, I'll drink it. I mean, right. I, I normally drink stuff. But the guy brings it to you and he went through all that. <laughs> Whatever he gave me, I was going to eat or drink, right? So we broke bread with him. We talked, and he told me his story, told me how he'd been fighting the French when he was younger and in the tunnels. And then he was fighting the VC, I mean, fighting the Americans, and, and then pretending to be on the other side during the daytime so everybody leave him alone. So he was playing both. But he was such a delight to meet. He was just a a grandfatherly guy take all his pictures out and show me this stuff there was no hate there was no anger not even against the french none of them and his father fought against the japanese and it was like and he goes there's been nothing but war on this property until you know 1975 or something then when the war was over but they had two three decades of war he says you know it's just whoever the leaders oh, are not as long as they keep me out of war, uh, and my kids don't go out of war, they can have any government they want. I want my grandkids to be safe. So that's the attitude there was just, we don't care about the government. You know, just let us live. Let us have fun. Let's, let's, let's raise our children. No more war. So he met him. I met him, and he, it was just a beautiful experience. And I, I told the guy, I said, you know, I said, I dreamt about meeting you before I took this trip. And the guy goes, yes. Yeah, I understand. Didn't even argue, just accepted it totally. Goes, yes, I understand. Had to happen, right? All right. So later on, we we leave this the third core area and we go up north to Da Nang and away. And we oh, just before I went, we went to Tainan Mountain, which is also locally known as Black, Black Virgin Mountain. And we had a base on the top of that mountain, special forces camp, and we had our soldiers down below. But the mountain itself, several thousand feet of it, everything around the mountain between the top and the bottom was VC tunnels. There was caves. Because I went, when I went back, I found, oh my God, there was a, there was a six story hospital under there with tile and everything. I mean, there was just beautiful caverns, huge caverns. I mean, we bombed, we, nothing ever affected these things. It was just, the whole inside of that thing was hollowed out. You know, like the hollowed earth theory, you know, there's people living in there. There was thousands of them, right? We're up here. We have special forces camp feeling very secure. <laughs> and they're surrounded by thousands of these guys right below their feet. I mean, they're just amazing. Anyway, so I hear all the stories. We go up there. That There's temples up there. And we went to the temples. And we came back down from the temples. And we happened to be there during April when they celebrate the victory over America. Mm. And, and all that stuff, you know, and, and the end of the war, 1975. So there, it's like 4th of July. And they had all these busloads of North Vietnamese veterans, old guys, you know. They were all there and they had, you know, old vets, those were parts of the uniform. You know, a old jacket that doesn't fit anymore, you know, and, and medals or, you know, whatever. And, commemoratives and whatever they can you know whatever they want to put on there right so we meet a couple guys and and this this old guy he's got this big medal there and one of our vets asked us what's that for and he says for killing americans and he's and, and we, we smile and we go yeah we got medals for killing you guys too and we all laughed and that was a big hug it was like yeah okay we get it you know big deal mm -hmm. and then, uh, we're, we're down at the bottom and and they had this these buses of these guys. And right in front of it was like a Mercedes Benz limo. Not a big stretch limo, but just a, a little limo. Mm -hmm. And I got this 
local television, Hanoi Television was there doing a story, you know, their news team, right? You know, the cameras there. Is it uh, Madam So and So, General So and So, or whatever, whatever, whatever title was? She's here. She'd like to meet you. She went, really? Yeah. And they told me like she was the most. She was like the Audie Murphy of females for that war. She was like the most decorated. I don't know how much it was real, yeah, yeah. but they told me she was like one of the highest decorated yeah. women veterans in that war. And that war, women were in the trenches, literally. They're, you know, and so I go there, and a car door opens up, and she's sitting in the back seat. There's this little lady, fat, teeth broken, black. I mean, you know, just she's dressed with this military uniform, an officer, obviously. And it looked like those Russian and Chinese things you always see where they're in a parade, like, a, or, or, or North Korea, where they got thousands yeah. of girls, right? You know, it looked just like that. It was just from there to there, right? Just medals. You know, ribbons, you know. And then she looks at me, she's just kind of like like a little girl. And there's this old lady, she turns it like, she's got a cane there. And she just kind of, and I looked at her and I saw the medals. And I go, you know, you didn't get those from just showing up at boot camp. You're out there doing something, right? So I pull back from her vehicle and I give her a salute. And I hold it waiting for hers. And she, tears started rolling down her cheeks, right? And then she just, she gave me a salute back, right? And I respect. And then I, I look up and there's this bus parked right next to hers and all these veterans looking out the window at the bus. And when I look up at them, I got like 30 some guys on the bus give me a salute. All hardcore North Vietnamese veterans. And of course, you know, the Vietnamese televisions eat this shit up, right? You know, but it was like, it wasn't about anything other than respect. I didn't hate them. They didn't hate me. They did their, for their things, for their reasons. I did things for my reasons. Now, I could not like their government. Yeah. I could hate the policy. I could hate the war, but I never hate the warrior. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one of the stories in my, a couple of stories are in my book. And it kind of ties together this theme that Veterans truly are, in this case, brothers and sisters. It's 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 a brotherhood, if I use that in a general term. Yeah. It's yeah. a brotherhood. And those have been it's gonna take well, it's going to take a long, long, long time, not in my lifetime, because current veterans of, of the terrorist wars, whatever they want to call them, a war on terrorism. I I don't see it happening in most of these veterans' lifetime. Mm -hmm. Because one side says, you know, okay, but the other side has never given up. The other side is still fighting. The other side is still, we're going to force our will on you. So I, it's hard to make peace with an enemy that's still really at war with you. But secondly, it's not about them. It's about you making peace. It doesn't matter about them. You make peace with them. You forgive them. You move on. You don't have to tell them that. You don't even have to, you don't even have to like them, love them because they're people, but you don't have to like them. Big difference. People say, well, what do you mean? You have to love everybody. Yeah, you do, but you don't have to like them. You don't have to hang around with them. You don't have to prove what they do. <laughs> Two different things. I, I think what you say is central to what isn't really talked about in a lot of the therapies nowadays it, it seems as though a lot of therapies coming out are like conveyor belt therapies because of oh this war started so we've got all these therapies but what i've been doing with some of my concepts much like you you know we've been living these parallel lives as far as researching things it's true it's interpersonal relationships yes the events are difficult you know as far as you know, seeing a dead child, but there's something about the different relationships that you have in war with the enemy, with your superiors, with your, your, your peers. And I guess that is something that you're bringing up here. And I'm wondering if, and I want to find this out because the VA, you know, in these therapies, they don't really, the VA and these nonprofits, they, they don't really engage these things. 
but I, I feel as though it's a spiritual matter that you've been working on for a long time. And I, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm also ordained, but I got ordained later than you and you started doing this work before, but uh, like you, I found that a lot of these spiritual, when I say spiritual, not religious, but spiritual, as far as something that's tied to meaning, like what you're talking about, these higher meanings from this day to day going to Wall Street. Walmart and all that kind of stuff and trading stocks. And so what I'm trying to say here and what I'm trying to ask is, you know, with the talk about these therapies and even spirituality, yet missing the points that you just kind of made, do you feel that some of these new therapies and even the VA when they use spiritual health, whole whole health, wholeness and health and all this, do you feel that they're kind of like lacking in looking at some of these things? Because what you're saying is profound. Well, actually, as you know, they got videos out and they got programs out now, the VA, you know, saying spirituality, and they're not talking religion. It could be religion for you. It could be. Mm -hmm. Could be. But this thing is all an inner game. Let's look at the history of the VA. In the beginning of handling this stuff, when they finally decided to do something, because you know, back to Civil War and you know the World War One, they just you know put them in a nut house and then let them go, yep. discharge them. And let, you know, it's at least, and then World War Two started discovering, oh, we got drugs, Korea, we got drugs, Vietnam, drug them, you know, Iraqi, drug them, you know, make them docile, take away the take away the fight, you know. Now the guy's just kind of, oh, you know, mm -hmm. but he's not violent. You know, right. that's not a solution, right? So, I, I I did a program twenty years ago after my second, third heart attack. Well, after one of my heart attacks, I literally got out of the bed after having five stents put in. Mm. The next day, I got to check myself out because I went from California. I had to go to Michigan because I was scheduled to work with the VA and PBS television and the uh, military the defense network, whatever it was called then, you know, television network, they showed the Pacific on t the Navy ships and bases and stuff, a program. And my program was, well, the, 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 the event that w was for PBS television was the art of healing. That mm. was the title, but it was about using, and it wasn't a new idea. I just formalized it. Yeah. So not original, but using the arts as a way to deal with things, meaning writing, memoirs, books, poems, art, art itself of all kinds, music, dance, whatever, taking your creative arts and using those as a way to deal with this inner stress. And I, I found, you know, the, you know, the music and all that stuff were good, but writing was really, it didn't care if it was fiction, poetry, memoir, non -fic. it didn't matter what it was but the closer it got down to what you had deal dealt with whether you fictionalized it or left it non-fiction you took this the demons here and you put it on paper or on a computer screen or wherever and it's like an exorcism it's like you've taken it out you you've moved it to a different level you don't have to stand around and tell your see that's what people understand the veteran initially wants to tell a story he really wants to tell people something because he wants he wants to be understood. First thing, not too many people were listening. Drug them up, shut them up, move on. Now they're there, or the therapist just let them keep rolling on and on and on and on. And, he, and 20 years of therapy, and he's telling the same story every week when he comes into a group meeting. That's like, we're getting nowhere. You keep retelling the same story. You keep re they don't know. Every time you tell a story, you're reliving the emotions. So retelling it is like, like picking a scab off a wound, it'll never heal. So I, I developed a program. It was three binders, typed it all up and everything. I did that and I did a film for public television. And it was all about this program and how it worked. What was interesting was they took all the work that I wrote, my binders, stamped VA copyright on them all, told me I couldn't use it, that it was theirs. And that was the end of the thing after I did all that work for them. I said, you know what? I said, if you use it, I'm happy. But it turned out the first year or two, all the guys I've been working for got bonuses. 
oh, look at the program I developed. And it sat on a shelf. It's like, what? But they all got, they all got, you know, you did this marvelous thing. You got this film developed for public television. And, and then they stopped showing it publicly because when I called them up, I said, how can we stop showing the film? Well, we're getting too many veterans saying they got PTSD. We can't handle the load. I go, what? <laughs> you don't want to do it anymore because you don't want people to know that they got PTSD? I go, okay. So anyway, so that was the beginning of that. And then I went off and I taught first. I wrote a, a thing for first responders in Michigan and Illinois, you know, police, firemen, paramedics, stuff like that, emergency room people. Same kind of idea. So that was beginning of 2000, sometime 2000, whatever it was. About 10, 15 years later, I, I'm in Ohio at VA there. My Military Writer Society of America, which I formed to, to carry out this plan, we went to the hospital in Dayton, Ohio. There's a VA hospital there. And we gave a program, a writing program and all this stuff, you know. And then the, the director goes, oh, we already got something like this. They bring out these binders. Beautiful VA stationary binders. Didn't change a word except everything's VA. I go, yeah, I'm familiar with that. But I didn't get mad. Part of me goes, they're using it. That's all I cared about. They're using it. Now, there's some people who get, well, it's mine. I invented it. I, where's my credit? Where's my name? Not even the credits, not even the, the acknowledgements, nothing, right? It was like, who's Reverend Bill? Hmm. But you don't do things for the personal gain and the personal glory. If the idea is to help people and they use it, put their name on it, I didn't care. Great, go do it. But it was interesting that it took a decade at least a decade before it got out there and uh, so that's kind of what i'm doing but to get back to your main thing mm -hmm. and that's important to know because a lot of people i call them new jacks they think you know the veteran writing just started the writing groups just started you know and all of this stuff and it's like they're new jacks you know it's a new new war and they're trying to sell all this stuff commodify it and so it's important to know that i know you've you know, a lot of your writing has been around before the war on terror. And that's, that's a lot of evidence showing, you know, of the continuation of the work and also the influence. So it's, yeah, I, I, I just want people to know, just look up William McDonald, Bill McDonald, read the books, read the poetry, read the articles. It's not just like one or two things. And it's how I say it's a people's evidence based because you've got many people that have written about you and have, you know, put you on, including myself and have learned from you. We all learn from each other. There's not anybody I haven't helped that I haven't learned something from as well. So we got a society where people become the teacher. They become the instructor. They become the guru. They become the expert. And their prodigies never can get better than them or no more than they do. <laughs> so it's about them, right? They're in charge. I'm giving you insight. You know, to me, it's like, if you're a teacher, you better be a good student as well. It's You should always have room to learn. If your cup is full, you, then you got a small cup. Get a bigger one thing, one thing that I I can verify so that people know that you know you're not talking smack here is Reverend Mac gets emails left and right and uh, yeah well you know when I went through that whistleblower at the VA and you know I lost my child visitations and I was in a dark place you know you you periodically called me even though you know you get barraged by a lot of stuff and you have your own kids you have your own retirement and your own activities you don't have to be calling me. And I just always remember that when I was in those dark waters, extremely dark waters, as, as you know, and we could leave it at that, that uh, your, your calls made a difference. You wanted to know, and this is what I said in, in my last audio, you wanted to know, to know the person of me, that you wanted to know the veteran in me, the, the, the person with a son in me. You wanted to know these things and you always 
start a conversation by that. So I, you know, I wouldn't have put you on here and I wouldn't, you know, say these things if they weren't real and uh, they are real. And I want our viewers to know because, you know, we can become students and teachers at the same time from the people we hear. And so I'm offering this period of time with Reverend Mac because he's traveling a lot. He's doing different things and he doesn't have to be here. And to share that is very important. I'm going to be doing a free veteran workshop uh, when I get through. I, 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 we didn't talk about it, but yeah, I, I'm now recovering from 13, 13 surgeries to my face and head in 15 months, over 200 and some stitches. And I got another one, two, three, or four more operations before the end of the summer. And I'm talking major stitches and, you know, when I say surgery, we're not talking, you know, burn or freeze off. I'm talking cut, burn, stitches, you know. I mean, you know, you take it out tumors. So I've been going through a lot of stuff. So therefore, I, I and then with the COVID out there and travel crazy at the airports trying to get places, I haven't been out there during this whole period. What I'm biting at the bit to go to North Carolina Florida and other places on the East Coast and offer veteran community. I never charge anybody anything. I, I take if people want to help me pay for the venue. Okay. I, I don't twist any arms. You want to donate something for that. If you want to buy my book. Great. I'm not crazy because my wife would be happy if I didn't go too far in the hole. But if I can break even, great. That's a success. If I only lose a little bit, great. It's like my wife gets mad at me. She says, you sell thousands of books, but then you give 10,000 away free. What? That's not a business. That's not a business plan. I said, yeah, it is. Because the thousand I sold helped pay for the ones I gave away. I only lost a little. Anyway, bottom line is I'm going to give a workshop, probably a two-day weekend workshop. And uh, free. You pay their own expenses and stuff and everything. But I want to combine a lot of modalities that, that I use and I want to try out with people. I'm not into the drugs as therapy but i'm not against them because there's some people that saves their lives let's get real okay it's another part of god he invented the drug if you need it great i i'm just not into long term as, a, as it's a crutch you got to kind of wean people off and there's some people you can't so it's all right no judgment but i want something different for people that are tired of that or they want something in conjunction with that because you know you could do both so we're talking about meditation we're talking about the way you look at life, the way you look at events happening to you. You're not a victim. That's a big bet. You're not a victim. And everything that happened in your life after that war experience, divorce, trouble at work, all these different things, that was your choice. Nobody's holding a gun to your head. You were emotionally holding a gun to your head, but nobody else was. So you have to take these people. And, and then so I teach people, forgive yourself. It's okay. Love yourself. It happened. I'm sorry. Move on. Time to grow new. You can't stay in the past. And veterans will fight me on this mentally and emotionally because they want to own their story forever because there's a certain comfort in knowing that discomfort that they're familiar with. Now I'm trying to take them naked into a new area of their life that says, you're not a victim. Whoa, wait, wait. It's the war did this to me. It was my wife did it. was the drugs. It was the alcohol. It was it. I say, no, everything that happened to you, you chose. That's why it takes two days to work on people. Because that's not the first message, the first hour. Trust me. You, you got to move people along so they realize. And then they don't have to buy into that. You know, it's okay. They don't have to buy it. They don't have to do it, buy into anything I say. But if I can get them to leave there willing to love themselves willing to forgive themselves and being grateful for all they have in their lives, no matter how they label it, good, bad, or grateful for everything. And if they, they can deal with apologizing, they're sorry. Like, you're sorry you made your family feel bad. You're sorry you made your child feel bad. You're sorry you abused your body. You're sorry that you, you did this. To somebody. You're sorry you made somebody feel this way. You know, it's, it's not a guilt thing. It's just, I'm, you truly are. We're all truly sorry we hurt somebody once upon a time. It's not saying we did it. We're terrible people. It just says, I'm sorry I did that. You know, you know, but it is. And I forgive me. I hope you do. Yeah. It's hard to ask people for forgiveness. Not your job. Not your job. 
-hmm. Or is our job to go to people and say, I forgive you, which is a lot of egotistical crap. This is an individual thing. You forgive people, a person may not even know it. But if people come to you and they're in a 12 step program and they're, they're seeking to be forgiven for what they did, you forgive them. If they come to you and they ask you for forgiveness, forgive them. Don't give them, I approve of what you did. You can say, I understand. I understand what drove you to that. I understand that. Blah, blah. That's all true. You can. You can understand. Well, again, you don't have to love them. I mean, yeah, you do. I mean, you don't have to like them yet, but you have to love them. So there's people that have wronged us in our lives, parents, people, friends, army, military, whatever. Yeah. You have to look at them and say, okay, I love you because you're part of me. We're one. It's all God. Love you. Maybe humanity. Who can't love a puppy or a kitten? But you get an old grouchy bulldog or a pit bull. Oh, I don't like that dog, but I love dogs. But this, you don't have to like that, that pit bull, but you, love, but you love dogs. All right. So the nature of man is changing. In other words, you can't go through life without facing multiple changes. Most of them are interior. And as you get older, you know, it's also physically. And it's also mentally. It's also, we're always changing. You don't have control over all of that, but you have control over how you react to those changes. You have control over how you deal with things. So you got a choice. Do you want to be angry at the world forever? Ah, damn it, this, you know, you know nobody understands me. You know what? I try to tell people, the world's not here to understand you. The world's not here to give you anything. The world's here not to hug you or love you. But you are, you're the one that needs to give, you need to give understanding to others. You need to give love to others. You need to give whatever it takes, understanding, whatever. Your job is to be there to love and serve, not be loved and served. Big difference. Yes. No hooks. So you can go out there and you can be kind and nice. I've done all this, all these people, nobody does nothing for me. Okay. So was it for sale? Mm -hmm. Are you doing these things just to get something back? Like you can love somebody that never, you know, they, they don't love you back. Well, you know what? I still love you. You're a beautiful person. I still love you. Whether you think I'm trash, doesn't make any difference. I still love you. I send you my love. Wish you well. It's hard for people to get there. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I had my druthers and I had the money, I'd have a, I'd have a month long, thirty day retreat in the in the in the woods someplace, you know, Walden Pond type experience, and I'd have these people that mm -hmm. I can, I can. I can work on it. If you're doing a two-day workshop, you gotta you gotta bring them along. And then on Sunday, you start on Saturday. On Sunday, when they get ready to go, you finally hit. Well, you folks, can't. I wanna I wanna interrupt Reverend Mac because I want to tell people if if you want to get involved, reach out to him or I. I definitely will pass that on to to Reverend Mac, but also I'm wanting him to make it to new york for a weekend so he can do something like this and so maybe we can look at that sometime in the future at least in new york i know you i know you've been doing it in different places but i i think the i think the vets here in new york need you because it's such an urban environment i i live in my bunker you know i can have food sent to me i i don't have to leave my place for anything, you know, but that's by making that choice, that's disengaging the world and it's limiting myself. And I think I find a lot of vets like that as well here in New York City. And I just think that it would be a refreshing voice to hear the words that you've shared today, but also if those words can be shared in a dialogical person to person way. So in the future, you know, to have you here and to reserve a space, trying me trying to find a space and stuff like that, and to get you out here and stuff for some vets, you know. Well, I'll tell you what, it, it doesn't take much to get me. I'm available for those that make any extension. I just need someplace. It can be a tent. I don't care. I just need someplace that's free or somebody takes care of the cost. Someplace to meet. Just has to have a bathroom. And a shade for me. That's it. I'm not, I'm not, it doesn't have to be Golden Palace or not. Just need a place to meet. I think your model for veteran retreats is something 
that folks should pick up on because, you know, the, the previous retreats that I attended, they were a disaster. And even one that I was invited to, I think, you know, and, and I'm not saying a disaster as far as the people were disasters, just the model. So the people were great and they're saints, Claude Anch and Thomas, incredible person. But this thing that you said is very unique that I've also thought about, but you've formalized, and that is the post retreat follow-up because, you know, you get back into the old habits, you lose community, you, you lose the feeling and the reflective mind from the retreat. And so you offer something that's very, very important because like I said, I either, you know, you know, it's the retreat that I mentioned, or, you know, I, I know Dr. Edward Tick, he writes a lot of great work, but I mean, he throws retreats and they wanted to charge me like a $500. I just got back from Iraq, you know, barely able to pay, pay. you know, I'm not going to talk about those bills, but you know, uh, well, think, about a, bills. think about a retreat where yeah. it, it's, it's, if you wish to donate, you do, if you can't or don't yeah. want to, because yeah. it's a choice. Yeah. Nobody forces you. You got a little basket off the side. I don't even see who gives. It's like, if you want to do that, or if you want to give me something on PayPal, great. If you want to yes. help with rent, great. And if you don't, no harm, no foul. I don't yeah. withhold anything. Yeah. You want to buy my book? Great. If you can't afford to buy my book, what price do you want to pay? $2, $5, $10, 0 Okay, great. It's not important. It's not about barriers to keep people out. Right. And, and that's why I don't make it religious focused. I make it spiritually focused. I treat this thing as a moral injury. Yes. And to go back to the very beginning of this conversation, when I was talking about Native American yes. traditions, American, Native American traditions, when they came back from a war, they feel like the people have lost a part of themselves, like their spirit has wandered off kind of thing. You know, it's like they got to pull it back. I mean, they've lost a part of themselves in this battle, you know. And uh, so when they come back to the tribe, that's their family, They'll be brought back into a sweat lodge together and they'll do a ceremony and they'll do a dance and they'll do all these ceremonies to welcome the warrior back, to welcome their spirit back, mm -hmm. to help heal them. And they do that after every battle. It was like, I'd listen to this guy talk about the history of that. And I go, I didn't know any of that. I did, never in a John Wayne movie I ever saw. It was like, what? So there was this tradition of taking care of the warrior, walking them, walking them, them home. Literally welcoming them home back to the tribe, to the family. So I know in Hawaii, because it's only tradition I, I, I got in Hawaii, you know, this spirit of family, the Hana, you know, the Ono, you know, all that stuff, you know. Yeah. But it was like King Kamehameha and stuff, his troops came back. They always had the Kahuna was always there, part of that battle after, before, and during, right? Yep. The Kahuna was there, right? Yep. And even in Asia, when we were fighting and we were using Hmong warriors, we picked mm -hmm. these guys up from the tribe. And 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 it and it, little short guys, right? But then I kept seeing these guys with a white scarf around their neck, and I go, "What's doing?" And they would tell me, "They go, that was their their shaman or whatever. I don't know what they called him, but that was like their religious leader, yeah. and he had the white scarf on there. All those guys made sure he didn't get killed, mm -hmm. so he had the scarf on, so they know to protect him. But he'd go out there and he'd be ministering to these guys and doing whatever he had to do. They took him to battle with them, so." Of course, then the VC figured that out, and that's the first guy they want to kill, right? right. So it's a crazy world. But right. it's, always been, it's always been the warrior tradition. St. Francis of Assisi. Yes. He was fighting the old wars you were fighting, right? Against yep. the Arabs and stuff, right? And he was a prisoner of war. Uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola. He yep. was a prisoner of war. I mean, you go down the list of all these saints, all these saints, they don't fight. No, they all, the real saints went through some crap, and they were veterans. Sorry, they really yep. were. Yeah. Mahatma Gandhi, he was a sergeant major in the British Army in South Africa. He was in charge of the ambulances and stuff. Well, you know, he saw some stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's it's the spirit that is wounded. And some people are so badly wounded in the spirit that they're actually spiritually dead. Reviving that is my job. And your and, job, that job is fitting with my conclusion, which I don't think it's the only conclusion about veteran readjustment, but it's one because 
when these people, you know, some of these young bucks from the war, you know, from Iraq, you know, they publish these bestsellers and stuff like redeployment or whatever book of the year. And they always talk about, you know, after, you know, I notice this is just my view on this, but not, I'm not hating. I'm just noticing it, you know, after the book sales, you know, they're like, oh, it's a veteran civilian divide. Society hates us and all this. And it's like the message that you've had and the message that I have is more, it's more an issue of unawareness. You're giving this information to our viewers, but you're also giving it to me because there are certain things that I don't understand about readjustment. And that's going to help me as I deal with my son, because the real environment is not in the book. It's what, how we take the book, how we take the message, how I deal with my son, how I deal with the VA that I don't yell at my nurse for, you know, you know, not giving me water when she gives me a couple of pills, you know, that's the real experiment to veteran readjustment and everything that you say informs us. And that is what I think is the real issue regarding veterans and society. There's a big job and it's an education process for the veteran. Here's, here's what I do my, when I do my freebie things, I always say veteran community. I don't say veterans only. Veteran community. Because if you're a child, wife, husband, friend, mother, father, if you've been affected, it's like alcoholism. You got, a, you know, you got Alcoholics Anonymous, but you also got, you got another organization for the people that were raised in an alcoholic family. I don't know what they call it. There's Al-Anon. a name. Al-Anon. Okay. Mm-hmm. And the same thing with drugs. And it's, yeah. Because what happened to you is like a virus. It spreads. When you hammer down on a nail, it has an effect on the wood in the nail. Mm. So yeah. your children feel it. And you will feel it for several generations out because it influences how your child grows up. That'll influence the next. It takes a while for it to dissipate. So you always want to start the healing process for yourself first, but you have to include the greater, even if it's only in your prayers, your visualizations. See, there's a lot of ways to tackle this, but they need to know that their feelings and their anger towards you, it's okay. It's all right. Let's talk about it. You know, you got hurt. At some point, they have to reach a point and just go, Okay, I got to own it. It's my anchor. All right. I got to own it. I can't keep blaming everything on my dad, right? It's like, so, but they have to reach that. You can't tell them that. I can. You can't know. You can't tell your kid, well, you know, all your choices are yours. It's not my fault. You can't tell them that. Right. No. And, and know, though, because- your words, yeah, your words help have helped me and the things that I've read and even Freud, when, when he talks about that, a lot of the anger is, 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 you know, that we have in violence and in wars and stuff is, is coming from self-directed stuff that you are kind of talking about as far as ownership. I've been able, you know, even my, though my son's 11, I, I know that I wrecked part of his life, but at the same time, that's okay. Not the, 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 the impact, but it's okay for me to talk about it to claim that history, that narrative, that historical inheritance or that historical trauma, and that that's different from, let's say, the relationship I had with my dad from the Korean War, where, you know, it hasn't really been talked to that much, but we're working on that. But I think I've learned from that in many ways to kind of improve and stop the cycle of all of this but you see now the cycle went for you and now it's going down all right so here's here's an issue that at more advanced talks i give i'm saying that because i i have to educate the people at some level of understanding with the basics yeah when somebody's starting to really move on i try to tell them you know what you're trying to improve relationship with your family don't do it to prove you're right or 
to hold their anger against you. They're entitled to feel any. They're entitled to feel any way they want about you. Give them that right. Yep. And you change. You evolve. It's up to them to catch up with you. End of story. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. That's your yes, job sir. to get them down and say, "No, you got to understand my dad. You got to understand me. You got to understand." No, you don't have to understand anything. No, nope. you just change. Right. Right. They'll catch up. Yes, they and won't. that's yeah. Catch up. No, everything you've said, you know, is something that's a jewel because you're right. And when you resist that, it only continues to perpetuate that cycle of historical trauma, historical intergener intergenerational issues and everything. And so it's just been a blast getting you here. And uh, I'm going to get you here again when you're free and uh, I'm going to have you in New York, you know, in the future. I really, really love your approach and love you. And uh, if folks want to get in touch with you, do you and also to talk about different books. I know you wrote a book about your journey to India because he's also a mystical veteran, really. And, and they're not, when I say mystical, I mean, I'm talking about real experiences. I mean, he went to India. I went to India after Iraq, but I mean, he took on India on a whole nother level and then wrote about it. Can, can you just briefly give a couple of sources where folks can kind of get in touch with your literature, with you, et cetera? Yeah, of course, I got a website, www, Rev Bill McDonald, just strung together, R-E-V-B-I-L-L McDonald. So RevBillMcDonald.com, and, and you'll, you'll get my website. If you go on YouTube video and you go Rev Bill McDonald, you'll get my YouTube videos. I have some on Vietnam and veteran stuff. I got a lot on the mystical. I got everything from... UFOs, out of body experiences, the near death things. I mean, my YouTube channel is all over the place. I've had over a million and something viewers, and it's only been up five, six years. So I think that's pretty good. And if you go to Amazon.com, you can get my book in several languages, in case you speak German or Spanish or something. But my books are up there. And if you actually, probably the one book you probably should start with is Warrior, A Spiritual Odyssey. And that deals with my, so my autobiography, deals with childhood. Vietnam and uh, life afterwards, and even going back to Vietnam and touring South America, working on a movie in the shadow of the blade, flying a helicopter, Huey helicopter across the country, and and but it's all basically it's it's loosely put together stories of my life, but it's really there's underlying current: forgive, love, serve. That's it. Great. Well. Thanks for being a contribution, not just to society, but a great contribution to the veteran community and also veteran culture and the culture of readjustment because few are mindful of these things. So thanks for being here and we'll see you again. All right, Rev. All right. God bless. Thank you very much. Veteran Etc. invites you to join us again with your host, Mike Kim, every Sunday. If the content from this podcast is informative to you, please share the podcast with others. Give a like and or post something you learned from the episode on social media. If interested in other truly informative podcasts like Veteran Etc., check out cominghomewell.com for a listing of other veteran-based podcasts. Thank you for tuning in.